بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Today, alhamdulillah, we come to a conclusion of our series of lectures here in Doha, Qatar, and the Fanar Masjid. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah, inshallah, in what was said in the last five lectures and what will be said tonight, inshallah, and to forgive us for any shortcomings or mistakes that were made during these lectures. Today's lecture, which is entitled The Fiqh of Salat, it's a lecture that was in, uh, originally requested by the brothers to talk about the description of the Prophet's prayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> As it came in the hadith, where our beloved Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam, he said, Sallu kama raaytumuni o salli. Pray as you have seen me praying. And then the brothers, I noticed before I came here to Qatar that they changed the title to Fiqh Salat. And this title, Fiqh Salat, is a, a very deep and in depth title. Six lectures, or three if we were to go and not into depth to cover the fiqh of salat. So inshallah, I'm going to talk about one aspect of the fiqh of salat, as it will come shortly, which aspect this is inshallah ta'ala. When we talk about the salat, we look at the status of salat in Islam, and the importance of the salat in Islam. We see that it's the second pillar of the pillars of Islam. And it's the most and greatest pillar after the pillar of the shahadatain, of the testimony of faith, of, shah- of the shahada of La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. And we see this when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'adh radiallahu an to Yemen. And he taught him what he needed as a da'i and he told him to focus on the key of da'wah and the foundation of da'wah which is what we mentioned the issue of tawheed. He said, إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي قَوْمْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Now this is the fiqh of the da'wah which we talked about before. As he knows the madru, the person who, who he's calling to Islam and inviting to Islam, he learns about him before he goes and knows how to deal with him. And he said, فَيَكُونَ أَوَّلْ مَا تَدْعُهُمْ إِلَيْهِ شَهَادَةً أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So the first thing you call them to is the shahada, the testimony of faith that there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that I am the messenger of Allah, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Then he said, alayhi salatu wa salam, فَإِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ If they answer this, and he, by entering Islam, uh, then you teach them, أَنَّ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانُ وَتَعَالَى قَدْ فَرْضْ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتِ فِي يَوْمِهِمْ وَفِي لَيْلَتِهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made compulsory upon them five prayers in their night and their day. And this shows the importance of the prayer. Because after he, thought, he, he focused with the shahada, the uh, foundation of the da'wah, and then entering Islam through Tawheed, then he went to the next step immediately, which was Salat, and this shows us the importance of Salat. And another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described the Salat as being the umud of the deen, which is <coughs> translated commonly as the, the pillar of the religion, or sometimes translated as the backbone of the religion. And whether it's translated in this way or that way, you'll see that the foundation of something, if it is weak, what happens to it? It breaks down and collapses. Also the backbone of the, of the human being, what happens if it's weak? Also he cannot stand. So whether it's the foundation of the backbone, we see that it's the, the importance of Salat and Islam when our beloved Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he describes it as being the umud, the foundation of the religion. And this is why he said in another hadith that the first thing we'll be asked about on Yawm al-Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, from our deeds is the Salat, is the prayer. So if, it, any, if it's accepted, فَإِذَا قُبِلَتْ قُبِلَ سَائِرْ عَمَلِهِ وَإِذَا رُدَّتْ رُدَّ سَائِرْ عَمَلِهِ So if it's accepted from us, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepted from us, then the rest of our deeds will fall into place and be accepted as well. But if it's rejected, 
then the rest of our deeds will be rejected as well. And this shows us once again the status of the Salat and Islam. And this is the first thing we'll be asked about. And all of our other deeds depend on being accepted. It goes back to the Salat. Was it accepted or not? Also, when we look at where the Salat was made compulsory, where it was made wajib on the, on the Muslims, when and where? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his incredible night journey on the Isra'u al-Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the salat fard compulsory upon all of the Muslims. No other, no other act of worship or no other pillar of Islam was made fard during that time. So this shows us, once again, the importance and the status of salat in Islam. Also the salat... It's always wajib upon the Muslim. There's no time when the salat doesn't become wajib upon the Muslim. There's no time, except for the woman, obviously, she has her certain time, but in general, there's no t- even if you're sick, if you're in a coma, you have to make up the salat later when it comes. Jazakallahu khairan. Al Hajj, for example, if you do not have the ability, Liman ilayhi sabila, who has the ability to reach Hajj, to go to Hajj, the capability to get there. If you don't have the ability, is it wajib? It's not wajib. So now we see once again the importance of the salat. Because at all times you must make it. A zakat. If you don't have money, you have to pay zakat. You don't have to pay zakat. So you see the pillar of the salat, it's always a, a must. and something you must do at all times. Even if you're, in the, uh, uh, you're sick, if you cannot... Uh, uh, what, even if you cannot move your limbs, you must even pray even if it's just by moving your eyes and blinking your eyes, subhanAllah. So the salat, it never stops being compulsory upon the Muslim. Also, when we look at the salat, we see what the salat, what it gives us from the emotional effect it has on the Muslim. The emotional effect it has on the Muslim. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ used to say to Bilal, his mu'addin radiallahu an, أَرِحْنَ بِهَا يَا Bilal. He wants to then he find the relaxation through the prayer, alayhi salatu wasalam. He would say, Abihna bihay bilal, because he knows, because the Prophet وسلم, and those who followed in his footsteps, who are truly the believers, they find this peace of heart, this halawa of iman, the sweetness of iman through their prayers. So we see now the emotional effect it has on the Muslim. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he say in Surah Al Baqarah? Usta'inu is sabr wa salam. And to seek assistance through sabr. Through patience and through what? The prayer. So now when a Muslim, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when they said, if he would find anything difficult in his life, he would immediately turn to what? A salat. Immediately turn to the salat. So it shows you it's, it's a way out for the true believer. And it's a way out of the difficulties of the dunya. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to seek assistance through patience and through the prayer. The salat as well, it is the difference between the Muslim and between the non-Muslim. And that's why it came in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, الْأَحْدُ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ That the covenant between us and them, meaning the people who are the non-believers or the non-Muslims, that it is a salat. So whoever leaves the salat, then he has committed an act of kufr. And the other hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ وَبَيْنَ الْكُفْرِ وَالشِّرْكِ تَرْكُ الصَّلَاةِ That between the uh, kufr and the act of shirk, between a man and the kufr and the act of shirk, uh, joining partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worship, is leaving the salat. So the, leaving the salat is just like what? The kufr, the disbelief, and the shirk, joining partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here is an important benefit that in these cases, as Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, as he mentioned, and Iqtidah Salat al-Mustaqeem, in his book Iqtidah Salat al-Mustaqeem, which alhamdulillah has been translated to the English language as well, he mentioned that in the Arabic language, in these type of hadith or ayat, when it says uh, Al-Kufr, in the hadith when it says uh, Al-Kufr, the, the Kufr, he said this, cho- this shows that it's the Kufr al-Akbar. That's the, the, the major Kufr, which means the person actually leaves the fold of Islam when he does it. So this Kufr that is in the hadith, and it says Al-Kufr and Ash-Shir, it shows that it's the major kufr, and it means that this person leaves Islam. And this is why it was said, and this was the understanding of the Sahaba, anhum, 
And that's why Abdullah ibn Shaqeet, rahimahullah, the tabi'een, he said that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and radiallahu anhum, that they didn't see anything from the deeds, from the actions, leaving it being kufr except for the salat. And if we look into the statements of the Sahaba, we would see the likes of Umar ibn Khattab, and Jabir ibn Abdullah, and Abu Hurairah, and Ibn Mas'ud, and Ibn Abbas, and, and Abu Darda. All of them, they have clear statements saying that whoever leaves the Salat is a kafir, is a disbeliever, and a person who has left the fold of Islam. It was also narrated on Ali radiallahu an that he said uh, that whoever leaves the Salat is a kafir, is a disbeliever. The narration on Ali radiallahu an when it comes to the Isnad, the chain of narration, the scholars differed. Is it authentic or not? Uh, in my first research, I found that it was not authentic, but I found recently some of our, of our mashaykh, they uh, see it to be Hassan, uh, the hadith. However, and whether it's, it's correct or not, we have a lot of the other sahaba, that who say very clearly that this is an act of kufr, and this is why the Imam Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, he mentioned that this is the ijma' of the sahaba. This is the consensus of the sahaba, they agree upon it, whoever does not pray, has left the fold of Islam. And this shows you the importance of them. Because like Abdullah ibn Shaqiq said, that they didn't see any other action when the person leaves it, being an act of kufr. It's an act of, of, uh, of disobedience, of ma'asiyah. But that doesn't reach the level of being an act of kufr, only the leaving of the prayer is this. One quick thing we ask ourselves now, what do we mean by leaving a salat? Does it mean that if we leave one, one salat, or two, or meaning leaving salat in general, that a person leaves the fold of Islam. Who knows the answer to this? Three Juma prayers. Uh, what else? Anybody else? And don't be scared. We're here to learn. Whatever you know, inshallah. I'm saying, how, how many salats? This is what I'm asking. A person, we said now, it's clear from the, from the hadith, from the statement of the Sahaba. Even it's one prayer by purpose. Okay, now the scholars who have said that the person who does not pray leaves the fold of Islam. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the brothers are saying Thalat al-Jum'ah, and he mentioned the hadith that whoever uh, leaves the Jum'ah, his heart becomes black and zahla khir. So now the scholars who, who have said that the person and who leaves the Salat has left the fold of Islam, they differ. How many Salats is it? Uh, if you go back to Fath al-Bari by Ibn Rajab and pay attention to this because the famous Fath al-Bari which is the explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari who is the author? Ibn Hajar uh, but the first person who started to do the a book called Fath al-Bari Sharh of Sahih al-Bukhari the explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari was the Imam al-Hafiz Ibn, Ibn Rajab al-Hambali Ibn Rajab al-Hambali and they say that Rahimahullah he started explaining the book Sahih al-Bukhari and when he reached the book of the janazah the funeral prayers his janazah left his house Rahimahullah so he, read, he, 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 he reached only the book of janazah but alhamdulillah has been printed and it's one of the most beneficial uh, sharus explanation of the Sahih al-Bukhari you'll find especially because he did a very good job in the book of Iman and it's very very beneficial there's two copies uh, that I know of that have been printed, one in ten volumes and one in seven volumes. So it's a very beneficial explanation. If you go back to the first few hadith, you'll see he talks about this issue in detail, and he mentions that a lot of the salaf from the, uh, any of the scholars of the past, they see that even if a person leaves one prayer on purpose and doesn't pray it, that he leaves the fold of Islam. And from the scholars of our time is our Shaykh, Shaykh Mbaz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he is also of this opinion that if anybody leaves even one prayer on purpose that he leaves the fold of Islam. And he took this obviously from the statements of the scholars before him. He also has a famous fatwa, rahimahullah, that if a person were to put his alarm clock every morning for Fajr on the t when it's time to go to work, as some people do now. When it's time, they don't put it on for Fajr because they want to get that extra sleep, extra boost for the day. So now if he has to be at work at 8 o'clock, he'll put the alarm clock on 7. 6.30, whatever, how much time he needs. But he won't get up for Salat al-Fajr. 
He said a person who does this intentionally, then he leaves the fold of Islam. Other scholars mention different things, but I'll mention what Ibn Uthaymin mentioned. He mentioned that it is the person who leaves the Salat altogether. He never prays. And this is an opinion that I see inshallah to be the strongest of the two. Uh, is a person who does not pray also altogether, he leaves the fold of Islam. And if you look at a person now, we have a lot of Muslims, especially in the time we live, and we know that perhaps they might leave sometimes, pray sometimes, and they're in a sirat. They're, they're fighting within themselves because they want the good and shaitan is pulling them away. And we know these people personally, inshallah, we don't believe that they have left the fold of Islam. But obviously it's haram what he's doing, he's in great danger. And just the fact that some of the scholars, a lot of the scholars, that's why I mentioned the book of Ibn Rajib al Hanbali, if you go back to it, you'll see he mentions it's one prayer. The fact that the scholars have mentioned this, it shows you the danger of the situation and how you need to focus on striving to never leave any of your prayers. The topic we want to talk about tonight when it comes to the fiqh of salat, I told the brothers, they said, what, is your, what are you going to talk about? I said, there's not enough time to talk about everything. So they said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, it's a secret. I'm not going to tell you. So they kept asking me, you have to tell us, what is it you're talking about? So I said, it's a secret. And so that's what I'm going to talk about, is some of the secrets of the salat. So alhamdulillah, I was telling them the truth, alhamdulillah. So it's the secrets of the salat, the asrar of the salat. Now, some of the forgotten fiqh of salat. That's what I want to focus on tonight. The fiqh that we have forgotten. Now, we say you need to do this, this is the sunnah to do this, it's wajib to do this, you have to make sujood like this. That's not what I want to get into tonight. I want to get into a forgotten topic about the salat. And these are some of the asrar, the secrets behind the things we do in the prayer. Whether it's the things we do in preparation, the sti'dad for the prayer, or it's the things we do in the prayer itself. And this is what we say, it becomes unfortunately for us a custom, a lot of the things we do. It becomes an ada. We always continue to do it like this, do it like that. And then we don't think of why are we doing this. So let's start inshallah, and we'll take a trip together, and stop in several points in tonight's lecture inshallah ta'ala, to look at some of these secrets behind the things we do in our salat and in preparation for our prayer. The first thing we're going to reflect on is the wudu itself. <coughs> in the wudu, the tahara, the purification of the soul, of the body. And because the tahara, and this is what we don't focus on, how many types of tahara, purification are there? Where are the brothers sitting? Ah. <laughs> How many? Two types of purification. I get to pick on them because we study fiqh together in the morning. And we study aqidah, so they should know the answers. Huh? And they always sit in the same spot, so it's easy to find them, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so now, there's two types of tahara, two types of purification, which is the tahara of what? Of the wudu itself and everything which comes with that. And then the purification of the soul. So a lot of us now, when we focus on the purification, the wudu, we think about the first type. How to make wudu, what sunnah, what should you do, what should you not do, what breaks your wudu. What we want to focus on tonight is what is meant by this wudu. What is meant by the salat itself is to purify what? Our hearts and our souls. SubhanAllah. How, th- how many times do we forget this? Look in the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ayat al-Wudu. Which verse is it? Verse number 6. Why is it? An, it's called Ayat al-Wudu all the time we study it in fiqh. Because it brings the fara'id of wudu and what you have to do in wudu, how you make wudu. If you don't have water, what you do. If you have a major, uh, you need the, the ghusl. All of this, it's mentioned in the ayah. So it's a very important ayah. But at the end of the verse, the end of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions to us, why he has made this wudu compulsory upon us. Who knows the, the, the verse? مَا يُرِيدَ اللَّهُ لِلَجْعَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ حَرَجْ He does not want to make difficulty. Allah does not want to make difficult for you. وَلَكِنْ يُرِيدَ يُطَهِرَكُمْ He wants, but he wants to purify you. So from this wudu, the goal behind it and the secret behind it is to purify you. Not just talking about the purification of making you clean. The purification more so of your heart and of your soul. Now, when we're making our wudu and the water is dropping off the limbs, it reminds us of what? Inshallah, when we go into the salat, how the sins, inshallah, also will be falling off like this. Subhanallah. How the sins, inshallah, will be falling off. And from the goals, the ahdaf of this prayer is for these sins to go away, for us to purify our hearts from all of the bad deeds and to get another chance. It's like it came in the hadith of the Prophet 
the person who prays the five prayers. It's like the person who leaves his house. And in front of his house is what? A stream that he washes himself in. And he said, will there be any sins left? So this is, this is one of the main goals. And we never think about this. So this is what we want to reflect on tonight. These type of things. Behind what we do. Also when it comes to the, the tahara, and the, uh, being purified, we want to be purified also in what? Our, 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 the way we look as well. And we, we want to, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, عند كل مسجد. You need to look good when you come to the prayer as well. So when you're making also the wudu, you're reminding yourself that you want to be in the best of states when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your prayer. Wear your best clothes. Make sure you smell the best. Unfortunately now, we find our, and a lot of brothers and sisters, when it comes time to their prayer, they wear the worst thing they have. You're going to the masjid, he's wearing a, dirt, a dirty thobe. Why? I'm just going to salat. Subhanallah. The other ones who come to salat al-fajr, how many times has it happened to you? When you come, mashallah, you're listening to the imam, and the guy comes next to you, and he yawns very big. And then he didn't brush his teeth when he came to the masjid. Subhanallah. A'udhu billah. And he ruined your salat for you. A'udhu bishahada. What is this? Happens all the time. So he said, oh, it's wajib, I have to come to salat. How many you came to salat? But brush your teeth before you come. Allah yadik. Subhanallah. It happens, I mean, how many times it happened? It's probably happened to all of us. So now, you're coming to salat, you're coming to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The malaika, the angels are there. You have to make sure you look good and you smell good. So also as a reminder, the wudu reminds us of this, that we should be in the best of states also in how we look uh, in our prayer. When it comes to purifying our hearts, this obviously a lecture needs to be in detail by itself and have several lectures I've given on the topic. But what are some of the easiest ways to purify our heart? I'll mention four quick things that help us, inshallah, in purifying our hearts. Ta'ala. First of all, is implementing and perfecting our tawheed, our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you perfect your tawheed, and you only worship Allah, and you remind yourself that these acts of worship are only for Him, and you do nothing for Him, your life becomes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything you do is an act of worship. You'll see what? This is purifying your heart. You're cleansing your heart because you're making your heart solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you implement the tawheed of the asma wa sifat, the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. Now, a person, we mentioned last night, we we're talking about tawbah. When a person comes to do that which is haram, displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he remembers that Allah is the sami'. He is al-basir. He is the all-seeing, the all-hearing. So even now, if nobody else sees you, you remember from the, when you implement the tawheed, the tahqiq of the tawheed, the implementation of the tawheed, you remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees you. He hears you. That's why I say the weakness of iman. If a person were to go into a room and do that was haram, and the door were to move, you find he jumps. He's scared. But if you're not scared from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to check out your heart. You have a, you have a serious issue. So now when you, when you have this iman, you implement this iman in your heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees what you do, He hears what you, he hears what you say, and you stop from as haram inshallah, this is one of the greatest things in purifying your heart. Also, the issue of the iman with qadr. That whatever happens in this dunya to you, you know, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why it came in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he mentioned al-iman bil-qadr, the pillars of Islam, he didn't just say Al-Iman Bil-Qadr alayhi salatu wasalam. What did he say? And to bil qadri khairi wa sharri. To believe in the qadr, the good and evil which comes from it. And the good or bad that comes from it. And this subhanAllah, when you have this iman, this strength in your iman, Allah, this will help you in cleansing your heart and purifying your heart. Anything that happens, you say, Alhamdulillah. It looks evil. That perhaps you do not like something and it's good for you. Perhaps you like something and it's evil for you, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. So now, when something happens, you say, Alhamdulillah, Qadr Allah. No matter how difficult it might be. And you say, if something good happens, you say, Alhamdulillah. And that's why I always like to reflect, and I mentioned in, in, in lectures before here, of the hadith of Ajaban li Amr al-Mu'min. It's, it's something strange, the affair of the believer. Because whatever happens to him, it's good for him. As the Prophet ﷺ said. And at the end of the hadith, if it was something good, he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's, it's better for him. And if something what? Bad, he has patience. And it's, and it's good for him. Alhamdulillah. This is what a Muslim, a true believer needs to, to believe and implement this iman of qadr in your life. Inshallah, bi'idnillah. This is one of the best ways to cleanse your heart. The last issue we'll talk about when it comes to the tawheed 
is the belief in the hereafter. Yawm al-akhir. When you have strong aqidah, strong tawheed, strong belief in the day of judgment, what becomes your goal in the dunya? The hereafter. Your, your goal is to get the jannah in the hereafter. You want to leave everything in this dunya, it doesn't mean you don't work, you don't do this, some people understand that. You strive in the dunya. We're ordered to strive and be the best we can be in the dunya. Whatever job we have, and whatever we do. But our main goal is where? It's to get the jannah. So when somebody's heart is attached to jannah, how's he going to be with the, with the dunya? It's not going to affect him. He'll be cleansing his heart because he's not living in this dunya with you. Well, like we see some of the, some of the mashiach, and I remember one of the ones who taught me uh, Tawheed in the second year of the college in, uh, in, in, in Medina. And this man, subhanAllah, may Allah protect him and, and give barakah to him and his life and his children. One of the best teachers who taught us, very good teacher. He taught us about Asma wa Sifat and about Qadr. So we used to see him, you'd see how he used to what? Dress. Very simple. A very simple white qutr like this, very simple thobe. And even the car he used to drive was very simple. And the brothers told me, he said, this car that he's driving, they forced him to buy it. He didn't know how to drive until a few years ago. Because he didn't care. And you would see him when he, just the way he walked. And he wasn't with us in the dunya. His, his reflections, his heart. I used to tell the student, I said, the shaykh is not with us. He's reflecting on the, on the akhirah. And you could see in his face that he was sahib layl. He was a person of the night prayer. And that's why the, some of the salaf used to say, the, the person of the night prayer, you can see the light in their face. It shows during the day. So this is how the shaykh was. So the, the person, when his heart is attached to the akhirah, then this is one of the best ways of cleansing our hearts. These are four ways from the Tawheed itself. The other three ways I said I'll mention quickly to help us purify our hearts is through all of the ibadat, all of the acts of worship, obviously the salat and giving your zakat and going for hajj and umrah, all of these things, any type of act of worship will help you cleanse your heart inshallah ta'ala. And thirdly, the recitation of the Qur'an and reading the Qur'an. And fourthly, the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barely through the remembrance of Allah, the hearts are assured. So a Muslim always needs to what? Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the companions came to him and he said to him, asked him for advice, he said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بذكر الله That your tongue will constantly stay moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're constantly remembering Allah. And we look at our scholars who implemented Islam, not just on their tongues, in their lives. We'll see, this is what they, they always remember Allah. The brothers used to tell me, when we go to, to visit Shaykh Mbaz, rahimahullah, we find that we constantly remember Allah. Because you never see the Shaykh except for, he's remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the time. And I always mention the story, the first time I met the Shaykh, when he helped me get into the University of Medina, rahimahullah, that when I went to him, uh, I came to him to give him the paper and he was on the phone with a phone call from France answering some questions from a sister from France uh, and then when he finished when he goes to talk to the person next to him he immediately starts Subhanallah Alhamdulillah La ilaha illallah, Allah, Allah. He waits until the, the reader starts to recite If the reader stops again something happens he doesn't waste any second Stuck for Allah Stuck for Allah Stuck for Allah You see remembering Allah Subhanallah and also when you look at the Salaf, how they were when it came to remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the scholars of Islam, the true scholars of Islam, they had something, and I, I believe I mentioned it here, is that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he had in his, uh, he, he used to, in his sitting, he had 5,000 students. They say that only 500 of them used to write. The other 4,500 used to benefit from his morals, his beautiful manners. They came just to benefit from the, from the manners of the shaykh. Only 500 other students were writing. I thought to myself, now we have maybe a few hundred people who come to lessons. And if we don't talk in the microphone, they have difficult hearing us. So I said, okay, it's a correct narration, but how do 5,000 people understand the shaykh? That's when I first started seeking knowledge. I didn't know this. So then we learned when we were studying the science of hadith, that they had something called al muballigh That and he, he would have different students in each part of the, of the masjid, he would say, for example, any scholar, we talk about scholar hadith, he would say, for example, hadathana waqi'ah, that waqi'ah, rahimahullah, told us. And he would go to the first student. Then he would go to the back student. Qala hadathana waqi'ah. Go to the back. Qala hadathana waqi'ah. He said hadathana waqi'ah. Until it gets back to the end 
of the circle. And just because they want to make sure that nothing went wrong in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, the, the same chain had to come back to them. You see what I'm saying? So it, go, it goes to the end of the circle and then has to come all the way back to make sure it's said correctly. They say, what was the scholar, the sheikh of hadith, what was he doing during this time? Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not wasting his time like we do. And uh, now, if we were to go, what's the first thing we would do? All of us. Huh? Telephone. Mobile. Huh? Text message, whatever this is. Allah musta'ala. And look at the difference between us and between them. May Allah guide us to that which is good. The second thing we want to reflect on is after we have made our wudu and we come to the prayer, we stand facing in which direction? The Qibla. What does this remind us of? First of all, the greatness of Mecca. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Ali Imran about Mecca? Inna awwala bayt wudhi alin nas Who finished the ayah? Lilladhi bi Bakka That the first house of which it was put for people was the one in Bakka Bakka another name for Mecca Then what did he say at the end of the ayah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Mubarakan Wuhudan And he described it as being a place of barakah a place of huda, a place of guidance, a place of blessing, a place of huda. And he said after the next ayah, man dakhalu kana amina. Whoever enters it, is, 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 he feels safety. And he feels safe in this place, subhanAllah. So this shows about the importance. When we face this direction, it reminds us that we are blessed as an ummah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us the direction of prayer, the, the best and most holy place to face in our prayers. Walhamdulillah. Also, if we reflect even deeper, and before that, I'll tell you an interesting story, before we reflect a little deeper, that a group of Christian missionaries in Indonesia, they were working to call Muslims to enter Christianity. So some weak Muslims entered Christianity. Not because they believed in the Aqidah, in the belief, but because they wanted what? Money. They wanted money. Because now they, they were getting money. They're very poor people. So these people offered them money and assistance. So I, they took it. Because they're weak in their iman. And they started to learn. And they were attending all the classes and learning about Christianity. So the people there, the Christian missionaries, they were very impressed. So they said, since you have you know, gotten to this stage when you, and you've done very well, we want to give all of you a gift. Anything you want, choose it and it will happen. So they went to the side, together with Indonesians, <clears throat> they gathered and held it up, and they went back and they told them, we've decided, and what we want, we want to go to Mecca. Huh? <laughs> so now, even though, and they brought astray, and apparently, in their hearts, if they're still attached where? To go to Mecca, this is what they want to do, all of their life. So then you see Mecca, alhamdulillah, the place that it has in the hearts of the Muslims, and subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. If we want to reflect deeper, if we look at the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, <clears throat> when he first went to Medina, what was the direction he was facing in the first 17 months? Jerusalem, Al-Quds. When he was in Mecca wasallam, also he was facing the same direction. When he was in Mecca, he used to put the Kaaba in front of him. So when it came time of this, he, 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 in his heart, he wanted to face Mecca. But this is what Allah has chosen for him. So alhamdulillah, he, he's doing as he's been ordered. But he keeps looking up to the sky, in hope. That's why I came to the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah SWT mentioned this. And then he mentioned at the end, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمْ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ رَسُولْ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلْبْ عَلَىٰ قِبَيْهِ One of the reasons Allah changed the Qibla was to test the believers in the first stage of Islam, when the, when the Muslim state was, was what? Was put together, it was established. So one of the first reasons the Qibla was changed was to test. And this reminds us also that we're in a test. In this life, we're here to be tested. We're in this dunya to be tested. Alif, Lam, Mim, Ahasib, Al-Nas, 
أي يتركوا أي يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون آه ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين الله سبحانه وتعالى made it clear in the Quran that you are here do you think you're going to say you're going to be left to say we believe and you're not going to be tested verily Allah tested those before us to see the truth and he will test us as well to know who are the truth and who are the liars subhanallah very very clear this is one of the reasons we're here so when we face this, this qibla it reminds us of the fitna of the, of the hardship that happened during that time because it was difficult for a lot of people now this, this major change in the religion during this time even the, the Jews during that time and the hypocrites and munafiqeen they took this as an opportunity to slander Islam and to attack the Muslims and the religion if this is the religion why is it like this? so in the days we live in this gives us what? gives us strength because now we're living in a time of fitna we're living in a time when our religion is constantly attacked from non-Muslims and from the people who claim they're Muslims who live in the Muslim countries look now in the last few years in Muslim countries the things you see said about Islam and the Muslims in the Muslim newspapers a few years back you couldn't have found that but now when, Muslims start, when the Muslims start to get attacked from the West they saw awe oh, their knight in shining armor has come to save them because these people are hypocrites obviously these people were hypocrites. So they found the opportunity to start slandering Islam from the inside. So now we see from the, the beauties of this, this test, alhamdulillah, yumiz al-khadith min al-tayyib. Allah shows you what is, that, was pure, that which is pure and good, and that which is not. And only the true believer, the true Muslim, is the one who stays firm during these hardships, and during these tests. So it's also one of the benefits we gain. We look at the, at the direction. Why are we facing Mecca? We want to reflect on this. All of these, inshallah, are things... We can gain and benefit from this, inshallah ta'ala. The third point, when we're standing facing the qibla, we have to have satul awra. We have to be covered in a certain way for our prayer to be accepted, men and women. What is the awra of the man? From the navel to the knee. Tayyip in salat, you can pray without a shirt in salat? Also, the shoulders must be covered during the salat. Jameen. What about the woman? The full body, except for the face and the hands. That's what some scholars see. And some say, she must cover completely everything. Her face and her hands as well. Tayyip. What, uh, what about salat? What must she cover in salat? In salat. She has to cover her face in salat? If there's men around, she covers her face, obviously. But if there's, if there's no men around, then she uncovers her face, and she can also uncover her hands. It's also important that we point out that uh, some of the scholars see that it's compulsory wajib for even to, to cover her feet completely during the salat, and whoever does not do so, that her salat is batila, it's not accepted. So this is important to be pointed out, also the woman must cover her feet during the prayer. But now, this, this covering for men and women, what is this reminding us of? It's giving us tadkir. It's reminding us of something. What is this? Hmm? That's right. There's no wrong answer. Maybe somebody will come with an answer now that I'll benefit from it. I'll write it down. Shame? Hmm. Shame. That you should have shame. It reminds us of how you should be outside of the prayer as well. Because this is you have this shame when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer. Also you should have it in all aspects of your life. And in all times in your life. So this cover, covering the awrah, it reminds us of this in the prayer. It's one of the great things we... If we reflect, we benefit. How a Muslim should be at all times. How a Muslima should be at all times. How she should be dressed, and how she should be pious, and she should be humble. The third thing we benefit is when we're standing in the qiyam. We're standing in the stance. We remind ourselves of that great day, on Yawm al-Qiyamah. When we'll be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة. And a day that will be equal to fifty thousand years. It will feel like it's fifty thousand years. We're standing there, waiting to be judged in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We're standing there, and we'll be covered in our own sweat, depending on the deeds that we have done in this dunya. So some of us will be covered, maybe halfway up to the knee. Some will be covered to his waist, and some will be. Uh, almost drowning in his sweat because of all the bad deeds he has done in this dunya. When the sun will come over our heads and we will feel this great thirst and everybody will be sent 
and they are as they were born, naked without clothes. Naked with no clothes. And that's why Aisha, radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet when she heard this. Men and women and everybody in one place with no clothes. So he said, uh, she said they have something much more severe than this. Nobody's going to be even looking at the other person on this day. Or as he said, alayhi salatu wasalam. Nobody will even dare to look at another person. Because his only concern is himself. SubhanAllah. If you look into Surah Abbas at the end, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about this day? يَوْمَ يَفِيرُ الْمَرُّ مِنْ And who else? وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي Why? He will run away from all these people. Why? لِكُلِّ مِنْ مِنْهُمْ يَوْمَ يَذِنْ شَأْنُ يُغْنِي The day that the person will run away from his own brother and his mother and his father and his wife or his spouse and his children. Are there anybody more beloved to us in the dunya than these people? Think about it. Your own brother, your mother, your father. And how much do you love them? Everybody. How much do you love your mother and your father? How much do you love your own brothers and sisters? How much do you love your wife? How much do you love your children? Look at the children, for example. Now, any parent, if his child would become ill, become sick, and how does the parent feel? How does he feel? Worried. He hurts inside. Wallahi, any parent that sees his child ill, he wishes he could take that pain himself. He wishes he could take that sickness and, and, he, and he could take it and, and for his kid. It's very difficult for a parent. That's how much they, they, we, all of us who love our children this much. A, a parent now, if he, if he, if his, if he would be willing to die for his kid. If you're walking down the street and a car is coming and it's about to hit your kid, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to go into the street to push him out of the way. Even if that means you being hit and being killed yourself. Because of this love you have for your child. But on that day, he won't even run away from him. Won't even be concerned about him. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that every person on that day, he has his own thing to deal with. Nafsi, nafsi. His only concern on that day will be himself. SubhanAllah. So this qiyam, when we're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it reminds us of that great day. And reminds us also, this is our one opportunity in this dunya to be, get prepared for that day. This is the only chance. You have no other chance. And we mentioned about this in the khutbah of Jummah, about the people who uh, regret and be biting on their hands, wishing they had followed uh, the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way of good during this dunya. The fifth point is what we say after we raise our hands. Allahu Akbar. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allah is great. If somebody were to become Muslim now, right here, what are we going to say? Allahu Akbar. We say it all the time. If somebody gets married, somebody has something good happen in his life, what do they say? Allahu Akbar. We say it all the time. But we say it on the tongue. What we want to reflect on now, is Allah really great in our hearts? Is He Akbar? Honestly, truthfully in our hearts. Everybody ask yourself. Everybody will say yes on the tongue. But in your actions, does it show up or not? This is, this is the question. So now if somebody, and he, when it comes to doing that which is halal, that which is haram, and he chooses the path of haram, is Allah already great in his heart? Not really. This is the truth. And they say, we have an expression we say in, 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 in I say we say in America, because I say we say in English sometimes, I find that the English don't say the thing, same things we do. So we say in America. The truth hurts. Sometimes, it does. This is the truth. So the truth hurts. And this is, so now this is, but this, what do we gain from, how many times? I'm going to give you homework tonight. When you go home, sit down and start from Salat al-Fajr. And count how many times you say Allah Akbar in the Salat in one day, the five daily prayers. And then ask yourself, Look at your actions. And the Salaf, Rahimullah, our pious predecessors, they used to always have what they call muhasaba before they go to bed at night. They would hold themselves to account for everything they did during this day. It's one of the great ways to strengthen your iman. You see all the, all the bad things they did in this day, and they make istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They beg Allah for forgiveness. And they try during the next day not to return to that. They look at all the good they have done during that day, and they focus on building on that in the next day. It's muhasibah. They hold themselves to account at night. 
So we hold ourselves to account and we ask ourselves when we go to bed tonight after we do our homework assignment, inshallah, is Allah really great in our hearts or not? On our tongues, mashallah, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, all the time. But in our hearts, in our actions, is He the greatest? This is one of the things that the Salat is calling us to reflect on and to benefit from. After that, the sixth point is where you put your hands and how you put your hands during the Salat. And this is important because it came in the Sunnah to a hadith. Or it came, uh, I won't say in the Sunnah, I'll say there is to a hadith about where you put your hand, the place where you put your hand. One of them is authentic, Hassan, where the Prophet used to put his right hand on, on, the, on the left hand on his chest. And the chest area, as the scholars of Islam described it, it's this area here, right on the, on the bottom, between the stomach and the chest. Not up here, some brothers you find them choking themselves. No. It's here, this is the chest area. The other brothers who put their hands down under the navel, this is a hadith that came on Ali uh, Ali Abi Talib, uh, radiallahu anhu. However, the, the, the isnad, the chain of narration, as the scholars of hadith mentioned, and it's not authentic, it is weak. So the, the hadith which is Hassan and better than that is the hadith about putting on the hand, on the chest. And then it came in the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, six different ways of putting the hand. Now we, we've, we've got the, it's on, the right or the left is the first step. The second step is on the chest. How you put it on the chest, there's six different sunnahs to do. It's actually three times two, which equals six at the end. So now you put it like this. This is one way. The second way when you put it in the middle like this. And then another way, the third way, closer like this. So these are three different ways. Uh, these are three different ways. We start here, here, and then you have to here, and then you have to the left side. So this now is uh, three ways to put the hand. The third way is when you grab it. They used to grab it sometimes, not like the three fingers like some of our brothers do, like this, no. Grab with the whole hand. You grab it from this area, and sometimes grab it from this area, and sometimes grab it from this area. So this equals six different ways of holding the hand, the hands on the chest during the Salat. What we want to reflect on is some of the benefits from this. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said, it's dhul bani yadi aziz. That it's a type of humbleness between, or standing in front of he who's great. It's a humble stance. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ chose this stance in his sunnah. Because it's a humble way of standing in front of Allah Taala. When you put your head down, and you put your hands like this, you'll see this type of humbleness, and it reminds you of that the Muslim must be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it reminds you that the Muslim, he's in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it reminds you also that a Muslim must be humble in all aspects of his life. The seventh point... is the dua of the istiftah, the opening supplication in the prayer. And there are different types of supplications you can find. And you can go back to the books of the sunnah, and I would recommend for learning the methodology of how the Prophet ﷺ used to pray, the book of the great scholar of hadith, Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al al-Albani, rahimahullah. Sheikh al-Albani's book, The Prophet's Prayer Described, or Sifat Salat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it is in Arabic. It's one of the best works, I, I believe, in the in, in, in how to pray. And the shaykh, in the beginning of the book, he mentions the correct methodology of the scholars themselves. He brings what Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, says about following the sunnah. And he brings what Imam Malik, and what Imam Shafi'i, and what Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, what they say about following the sunnah. As an introduction, Teaching the student who's reading this book and wants to learn the proper methodology. It's not what you found any of the four imams on, even though they're great imams. And we all love them. But what's important is that we follow what they say by implementing in the sunnah. So the shaykh, he, he goes now and he shows you, that this is the hadith and it's found in this book. So alhamdulillah, the shaykh was able to and he, uh, have a, the, the, the original book. It's three volumes. It was printed after the shaykh's death. But the small book, which is in one book, I actually had it with me, I forgot to bring it today, I'm sorry. But you can find it, it's easy, alhamdulillah, available everywhere. The description of the Prophet's prayer by Shaykh al-Bani, rahimahullah. The dua of istiftah, or the opening uh, supplication you make for the prayer, there's different types you can do. A whole bunch of them. But why are there, are there different types? What is the hikmah, the wisdom behind the Prophet wasallam saying different types of supplications in the beginning? 
to make it easy for the ummah. What else? Naam. Mumtaz. This is one of the most important points that the brother mentioned. So it doesn't become a common what? Like a custom or rotation that you, that you do in your life. You're just doing a certain thing. Because we, we don't want the, the, any... Also it makes... It gives, it gives life to the prayer. And you do different things, different types of sunnah. And then also each supplication has different benefits in it. And different things... Uh, uh, the dua in itself. Different meanings. So it calls you to reflect on it. And not to make your prayer a routine. So now when you have different types of sunnah, you memorize one today, next week you memorize the second one, then you memorize the third one, you'll find you're always changing it around. And that's why Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, he mentioned the importance of always changing and doing the different types of sunnah. Because it's, it revives the sunnah, first of all, and it gives you different types of, and it gives life to your worship. And in all aspects, and even for example, if you look at the adhan, there's two ways the adhan has been confirmed in the sunnah. So now, we try sometimes maybe to do the different adhan in certain countries if it's okay, depending on what the awqaf in that country say. But the countries who don't have problems with that, then they, do, they should do the different types of sunnah all the time. And you remind yourself of what? Uh, of reviving the sunnah and all aspects of life. That's uh, some of the hikmah behind it. Also, but what I want to focus on when we talk about the dua istiftah, what is the goal of it? Why did the Prophet ﷺ have this introductory supplication in the beginning of the prayer? Some of the things that I found our scholars mention, they said it's actually like an introduction from, from the heart to the prayer. It's like an introduction. You're reminding yourself because now you want to focus on al-Fatiha. You want to focus on your rukur, on your sujood. So it's like an introduction. And it's, it's taking you from the ghafla that you were in before. The absent-mindedness before the prayer. So it's an introduction getting you ready. Just like now, when you want to work out, you want to exercise, what's the first thing you do? Huh? Warm up. You do the warm up. So now this is a warm up, but a warm up for your heart. It's an introduction now for the heart, for you to what? Get ready for your prayer. So to focus on your prayer. The eighth point is the isti'adah, seeking refuge from the shaitan rajim, seeking refuge from the shaitan. And this reminds us that we're about to enter a battle. And we mentioned last night that we're constantly in a battle with the shaitan. And we mentioned the example of waking up for Salat al-Fajr. You wake up on time, you make it a little later, before the time goes out, do you go to the masjid, not go to the masjid? We're in constant battle with the shaitan. But more so in the salat. The shaitan, he focuses. And all of us know this. He reminds you of everything in the salat. Now, on our mobile telephones, what do we have to, to help us memorize the, 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 the appointments we have? We have the daily reminder. Shaitan comes to you with a free daily reminder every day in the salat. Reminds you of everything that you need. That what you need for next week, what you, need, what you should have done last week, what you should be doing today. He comes to remind you, oh, by the way, it's important, important, don't forget. You're like, oh yeah, it's true. So you're thinking, you lose it. The shaitan, he focuses on ruining our prayer for us. Because he knows, I told you last night, he's faqih. He has fiqh in the religion, he knows. He knows how important the salat is for you. To be successful in your life. He doesn't want you to be successful. He doesn't want you to go to Jannah. He doesn't want you to find peace of heart. So he's going to focus on destroying the key to that, which is the salat. He's going to focus on the salat and try to ruin it for you. So this is a reminder to us that we're about to go to war with the shaitan. And it's a reminder to us that we're in constant battle with the shaitan in everyday life as well. It reminds us of the in prayer and also outside of the prayer. Something interesting I found that Imam Ahmed said, Rahimullah. He said that what you gain from your salat in the dunya, or how easy it is for you to be successful in your salat in the dunya, this will be how easy or, you will, or successful you will be in the hereafter. Pay attention. And you know, what you gain from your salat. Because it came in a hadith, you, you get some of it, some reward for part of it, or half of it, or less than that. Depending how much effort you put into battling the shaitan and focusing on benefiting from your salat. You'll get the reward for it. And as it came in the hadith, that some of it will be thrown back in your face. This is you didn't take care of your prayer, and it gets thrown back in your face and, and not accepted from you. So now, uh, Imam Ahad said, the success, the success you have in your prayer, benefiting from your prayer in this dunya, this will equal the success you will have on the Day of Judgment, subhanAllah. And I'm going to tell you a story that shows you how bad the shaitan can be when it comes to us in our prayers. A story that happened in a Muslim country where they used to pray the Dhur and the Asr and the Suq in the market area. So every day, they had one of the, the traders there, the businessmen, he would lead the prayer. So when he sat down, 
for what he believed to be the fourth rak'ah and they believed to be the third rak'ah they started saying subhanallah subhanallah because they're saying it's the third rak'ah and he believes it's the fourth so he's not he's not budging and this is the, this is true if you're the imam and you think what you have is done is correct and you're sure then you don't listen to the subhanallah but if you have doubt then obviously you get up and continue so he was sure that what he was doing was correct and he didn't listen to the subhanallah so he said assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah they looked at each other and said you paid only three rakats he said no four three four three four three four he doesn't want to tell him the truth of how he knows he said I'm 100% positive that I paid four and they said no you paid three and they're getting into it back and forth three four three four so he said look I said, I'm going to break it down to you he said in this souk here in this marketplace I have four stores and every day when I pray I lead you guys in the door I go to each store he said, in the first rakah, I go to the first store and see what's going on in the store, what do I need, I need, I need new stock, I need new this. So he said, I, I went to the first store, I went to the second store, I went to the third store, and I went to the fourth store. So he said, there's no way I prayed three, because I know I went to all four stores today. SubhanAllah. Look how shaitan, and he corrupts our prayer. And this guy is saying, he does it every day. A'udhu billah. SubhanAllah. So shaitan, he focuses on the prayer. The ninth point is the Bismillah, of saying Bismillah. What does this remind us of? The Bismillah. Mumtaz. Everything is in the name of Allah, especially the Salat itself, that you're about to do. It reminds you not to have riyah. Not to do it and if somebody else is looking at you because you want to look good in your Salat. And that's why now they say, when it, the shaitan, if somebody comes in and you recite the, the Quran, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Somebody comes in, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. You beautify the Salat. And then all of a sudden your back is straight now. Be sure that this is from shaitan. Audhu billah. May Allah protect us from that. So this reminds us of Bismillah. It's who, who, who are we doing it for? In the name of who? In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this throws out that it's for anybody else. Only for Allah. This act of worship and all acts of worship are only for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first reminder. Also, as the brother mentioned, that we, it reminds us that everything is for Allah. Everything that the Muslim does in his life is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي for who? Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. La sharika la. Now, in this, in this ayah, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, say, verily, that my prayer, my nusuk, my other acts of worship, slaughter and what have you, other acts of worship, and my life and my death, therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will not join any partners with Him. Subhanallah. There's a reminder, a Muslim reminds us when he says, Bismillah. And we say all the time, Bismillah, Bismillah. But how deep, we want to reflect on what we gain from this Bismillah. Are we gaining anything from it or not? Is our life actually for Allah or not? Are we living for Allah or are we living for shaitan? And for our, uh, in, in being slaves of our lust and our desires. So now, this is a reminder. We say, Bismillah, that we must live as Muslims only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the mercy of Allah, that if we make everything in the name of Allah and everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you get reward for all of this. Even something very simple. When it comes to feeding your family, the Prophet he said, even the food, تَجْعَلُ فِي فِي إِمْرَأَتِكَ Even the food you put in the mouth of your wife, it's what it's ajr, if you have the, the correct niyyah. And unfortunately, we don't focus on benefiting from this, because it becomes custom. Just like the salat we're talking about now, it's become adit, it's become custom to do this and to say this. Even every aspect of our life, if we have the correct niyyah, the correct attention, we'll get reward for it. Now, as a Muslim man, is it compulsory upon you to take care of your family, your wife and your children? It's not up to you. As you always tell my students, I said, even if your wife makes 50,000 a month and you make 10,000, you can't have any of her money in Islam. If she wants to give it to you, it's up to her. But now you have to do everything. You have to pay the rent, bring the food, everything. So it's a wajib. You have to do it. But you can, get, you can do it as a custom and not get reward for it. You'll get reward for it because you're doing your wajib. But I'm saying, if you focus on the act, making it an act of worship, an act of ibadah, you'll get even more reward for it, inshallah ta'ala. That's what I want to point out. The tenth point is the Fatiha itself. How much time do we have left before they're done? Eleven minutes. Eleven minutes. They do not 